Hello everyone. So uh, today we have with us uh, Ambassador Michael Pulch. He is uh, the EU coordinator, the EU senior coordinator for uh, EU's coordinated maritime presence and maritime security, especially in the Northwestern Indian Ocean region. Welcome, sir. Pleasure to be with you. Swasi. So, um, you know, I think one of the interesting things that have happened lately is that EU was looked upon as a major economic player in the world. And with what now the EU is doing with respect to enhancing its maritime presence, it's trying to, uh, you know, get into this role and posture of a security provider as well. So how do you assess this? This is, in my opinion, a very significant change. It is a significant change in some ways. Um, but it already dates back uh, also to the Lisbon Treaty uh, right. uh, of a, a good uh, dozen years ago, um, when we decided as a European Union to strengthen our pillar on foreign and security policy. And uh, uh, in recent years, uh, we've now developed also a stronger uh, defense uh, policy angle. Uh, and of course, the situation in Europe accelerated that move. Right. Yeah. And so, so that's, that's the interesting bit, because for a lot of people uh, worldwide, they would expect that the Russia-Ukraine war would actually impede Europe's capacity because of all the economic setbacks and all the industrial closures and the reports that we keep seeing. So it would generally be expected that the, uh, the ongoing war, it's already been stretching on for a year now, it would impede Europe's capacity to actually engage with the other parts of the world or have a more global outlook and they would be more concentrated you know within uh, Europe to solve their security concerns and problems but on the contrary that's what I observe is that on the contrary this has actually accelerated their engagement with Indo-Pacific and uh, you know with their engagement with the rest of uh, you know the world both economic and as a security provider so so how do you how do you understand that and where would the economic uh, say for example the finance the finances would it uh, for it would come from hmm. I think your, your assessment, Slasi, is spot on. Uh, I've served for uh, nine years as EU ambassador to Singapore and, and then lately to Australia. Um, uh, and, in, and indeed, uh, we often got the question, how can you uh, develop a new policy towards the Indo-Pacific and at the same time deal with um, a war uh, on your doorsteps? And uh, the answer to that is, uh, we actually need to be more engaged with the outside world than we ever did before. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in Australia, we engaged actively the Pacific Island countries to talk about the violation of the UN chapter as a right. result of, of the Russian aggression. And that is a point that uh, everyone understands. And they voted in UNISO in favor of the resolution at the UN condemning the Russian's aggression. Um, so what we need as a European Union is to engage closer, particularly with the Indo-Pacific, uh, economically, politically, but also in some ways in security matters. Right. Uh, so, Ambassador, talking about Indo-Pacific and EU published its Indo-Pacific document and, uh, you know, now the CMP, which is the Coordinated Maritime Presence, uh, you know, this entire thing is also somewhere drawing you know, from that engagement, uh, you know, policy. And it's not just the Indo-Pacific. I think a lot of people would not know that there are small little components like, for example, the ESIWA or CRIMIRIO or, uh, you know, the Global Gateway and the Indo-Pacific. So, in a broad sense, how do you sort of connect these dots? Because mm. these are all European initiatives. And they are all somewhere looking at Indo-Pacific and maritime, so to say, security and later on the maritime economy, for example. So how would you connect the dots? Mm. I normally start explaining what we're doing now with the Coordinated Maritime Presence Initiative for the Western Indian Ocean by saying it brings together the two main strands of European foreign policy at this point in time. One is maritime security right. strategy. We are updating uh, the one that we've given ourselves in 2014. Um, I expect the new strategy, which looks at the current challenges, uh, will be uh, finalized in about two or three months' time. I see. So that's one element. Uh, and by the way, uh, we are not the only country that it gets more active on maritime security. Uh, we learned today and, and I met the newly appointed uh, maritime security coordinator of the Indian government, which a position that exists now for one year. Um, on the other hand, we have the Indo-Pacific strategy that we've given ourselves a good uh, one and a half years ago. 
and uh, uh, our high representative, uh, when he spoke uh, about the Indo-Pacific strategy, said the CMP for the Northwestern Indian Ocean is an implementation of what we're doing uh, with the Indo-Pacific region. And it's true. We've chosen this maritime area of interest because it engages us in, in, in an area of economic growth, because right. it engages us in, in a part of the maritime space that connects Europe and Asia, and where we are already active with two European operations, Atalanta, yes. a very important European initiative at the time to combat piracy, mm -hmm. very successful, yes. with the help of friends and partners like India, right. um, and an operation by European member states called MSOR, European Maritime Awareness Strait of Hormuz, to de-escalate uh, de tensions uh, around that area. So there are very good reasons for us to be here. And you mentioned a few other strategies that we've given ourselves uh, to look at regional elements of that. So there is one for the Horn of Africa, mm -hmm. because we have to deal with piracy in a, in a horizontal, holistic way. Uh, there is one for the Gulf and the GCC countries, uh, because indeed our relationship with this, this this part of the Indo-Pacific also uh, grows uh, as a result of us changing pipeline-based energy from Russia. Absolutely. And replace it by yes. LNG, which comes in the, to a great extent also from the uh, Pen Arabian Peninsula. Um, so we are putting all of that together. And India, of course, is in the center of the Indian Ocean, as the name applies implies and um, uh, we have a growing relationship with India um, and uh, we're currently preparing for a successful summit this year right uh, relaunched our negotiations on free trade agreements yes. and generally find um, a, a welcome here in New Delhi when it comes to more European maritime presence in the region yes, I would agree uh, so, how does the, uh, this concept of the coordinated maritime presence plan to collaborate with, for example, the Indian Ocean Rim Association or the Indian Ocean Commission, etc.? Because one of the things that catches my attention in this concept is that it is going to be, um, you know, a coordination of uh, available resources or vessels as and when required. It is not going to be under the national uh, chain of command, you know, so I think that is a key difference about this from the Atlanta. So, I mean, how do you sort of um, um, explain that in an easy mm. language? Well, in an easy language, um, I would say the key difference between what we call coordinated maritime presence or CMP um, from an operation like Atalanta is that um, the vessels that are deployed uh, under the CMP will not be under the uh, command and control and command of an operation. So right. uh, member states will remain uh, in command and they can choose in a flexible way um, the uh, deployment of their vessels for a European CMP activity during the time that they are in, in this area, the Western Indian Ocean. And. Uh, so that, that is, in principle, a different modus operandi that allows us to use, uh, in, in a more flexible way, assets that are here. Um, and how it, do you intend to collaborate with, for example, the IO Rao or IOC, etc.? Yeah. Yes. Um, part of our outreach is to also become more associated with uh, organizations that operate here in the region. And uh, one of my first tasks, in fact, when I took up my position uh, five months ago, was to join the annual meeting of the JIDA uh, Code of Conduct uh, mm. that brings together coastal states yes. uh, of this area to talk about the challenges in the maritime security area. They talk about uh, piracy, they talk about drug smuggling and other challenges that we see. Um, and we are supporting their efforts uh, on maritime security by inter alia supporting the development of their own maritime security centers. Right. And that means that we want to engage more with regional uh, organizations that do exist. Uh, DCOC, we are attending to become uh, what they call friends. 
uh, of the DCOC um, with IORA, uh, Indian Ocean Rim Association. India, of course, was a founding member. Yes. Um, and this topic comes up in all the discussions that mm -hmm. I had here. I'm sure. Um, we are uh, actively pursuing to uh, become an, a dialogue partner for IORA, and I hope that uh, this can be finalized, this process, in the course of this year. Right. Uh, with the Indian Ocean Commission, we work very closely on a number of programs that, that we um, implement and, or they implement for us uh, in the region, particular in the southwestern Indian Ocean, the, the island community. Um, and, uh, and so we will foster and promote these ties uh, within the region to make uh, sure that uh, Europe is present uh, when uh, issues are discussed, where we, where we know what the region needs and how we can be of support. And I think one of uh, the key uh, convergences then would be on the factor of the maritime domain awareness, because that is one area that India is also looking forward to, um, I think, through lots of other institutions and the situational awareness and domain awareness. And uh, uh, so I, so do you have a specific, uh, so to say, plan of action for how do you uh, intend to enhance the capabilities, the MDA capabilities when it comes to cooperation with India? You're absolutely right, uh, Swasti. Uh, maritime domain awareness is a key element uh, for maritime security for many of the countries because they lack the capacity or the tools to do it themselves and we support that. Um, we have developed, therefore, through a program that we set up uh, at European level uh, called Crimario, Cr uh, Critical uh, Maritime Routes of the Indian Ocean, um, an information sharing platform called IORIS, Indian Ocean Regional Information Sharing, um, uh, which we offer to coastal states free of charge okay. um, and to the Djibouti Code of Conduct community as such. Right. It allows um, secure information sharing um, uh, either within a country between the different agencies and ministries that are concerned with maritime security, so the Navy, Coastal Guards, Customs, Law Enforcement, etc. I see. But also and uh, primarily um, between uh, coastal states. Okay. And um, uh, the beauty of this program is um, that is a fle very flexible tool. Um, they can use it any way they, they want. They have access to it. They are master of their, their own usage. Um, and it complements an American system called Sea Vision that exists yeah. in terms of data analysis. So right. when I visit it, uh, or when I do visit Amer maritime security centers, I often see that they use both systems in parallel mm -hmm. because they, they, they cover different needs that the countries do have in terms of maritime domain awareness. But then Ambassador, one it uh, makes one think as to the so far, the, the area of intervention that you are, uh, be, you've been discussing all, all this while, seems to be on the western side of the Indian Ocean. And if it is about, if the objective of uh, CMP is about protecting the vital slocks uh, in the Indian Ocean region, then one of the most vulnerable and vital slock is the Malacca Strait, which is on the eastern side. So, do you think that the CMP would eventually take that into account and move here because, of course, this is a region which, which comes with its own geostrategic limitations and, uh, you know, strengths. It also has lots of other, uh, you know, multilateral, plurilateral arrangements. So, so you do see that in, in time it will sort of come to the side of the ocean as well? That's a very good question. Um, we um, started the debate about the uh, CMP here for Northwestern Indian Ocean after we had a first successful pilot project in the Gulf of Guinea. Right. Uh, by the way, an area where also India had been uh, cooperating and supporting us at times. Um, and so we've chosen a, a, a new one, a second one, and we've chosen this area here for the reasons that I mentioned at the outset of, of our conversation. Um, and uh, th this now, takes place this implementation in, a, in, a, in an area that has much more complex settings. 
uh, with several choke points for sea trade. If you look at Suez Canal, yes. uh, Babel London, Mundi. Strait of Hormuz, yes. Mozambique Channel, etc. Um, and, uh, and that means that we have to prove that our concept is meaningful and operates well, also under a much more complicated and complex set of circumstances. I am convinced that once we prove that this is a welcome European um, provision of maritime security for the region, member states would be well inclined to look at other areas uh, where we could uh, also use that, that concept. Um, and in that discussion we will see uh, which area they will show. There are a number of good reasons, uh, as you say, um, to look at the Eastern Indian Ocean. Um, but uh, first of all, our task is to make this a success. Right. Um, and India is a key partner for us, and that's why I'm coming to New, New <laughs> Delhi at, in one of my first outreach missions. Right, absolutely. Uh, so, Ambassador, that kind of uh, then brings us to this entire thing where, of course, Europe is undergoing a phase of uh, energy, of diversifying, you know, its energy sources and uh, looking at making this transition to cleaner forms of energy. And of course, one, when you look at the maritime space, it's also promising because there are so many uh, potential and possibilities when it comes to ocean energy, you know, the marine energy. And I mentioned this because I think in 2020, the EU came up with a strategy on their ocean energy. And then India also is coming up in, you know, with certain strategies now to sort of, t uh, um, um, you know, build on those uh, possibilities. So, what then uh, would you say that the coordinated maritime presence, you know, in, in, a, in a more futuristic way would, you know, that would sort of uh, be a reason for Europe to also enhance this coordinated, coordinated maritime presence as the sources of energy shift and come to the ocean? Well, um, let me look at, uh, at the CMP from, from the angle of, of energy diversification. Um, indeed, uh, there are two important trends um, that we see at this point in time which make Sea Links and CMP initiatives uh, more important than ever. One is an increasing economic reach out to the uh, countries of the Indo-Pacific with free trade agreements that we finalized with a whole range of countries already, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Singapore, New Zealand. All in recent years, Australia, perhaps even this year as the next one, and India will India, negotiate. Yes. So that's that's one trade, uh, one aspect that will increase our sea trade. The second one is that we are shifting our energy supply from land-based pipelines to sea-based LNG exports. Um, and uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, energy and green transition that we decided on. Um, this was endorsed before the Ukraine war started. The European Green Deal came about in 2019, so exactly. that was the start. Yes. Exactly. We started at that time and uh, we thought we were giving us a very ambitious agenda already. Uh, the Ukraine war has supercharged that uh, because uh, we decided uh, that very quickly that we have to completely differentiate and, and change our energy supply model, Absolutely. move away from the dependence that we have from, from Russian uh, gas. And we do this in, in a number of ways, one of which is uh, building more LNG capacity, so replacing gas with gas, if you wish. Yes. Um, secondly, developing alternative sources. Um, uh, hydro uh, would be uh, a, such an alternative source and we are currently building ports to allow us to import that from other countries. Um, accelerating the green transition in um, uh, energy from solar and, and uh, other sources, wind energy, etc. Um, and uh, of course look at energy e efficient um, measures so from the construction side to uh, uh, energy efficient uh, transport systems. Um, all of it means that we are looking at different ways of replacing of uh, fuel-based energies with replaceable and sustainable energy uh, supplies. 
and ocean energy may well play an important role in that. Right. Um, we are developing this in any directions. Uh, we take note of the fact that India is taking similar yes. uh, measures. Um, and um, there is one aspect that I find interesting and that I like to talk about is the fact that we are spending an enormous amount of money on research and scientific yes, development. Yes, yes, Master. We have set up uh, the Thor Horizon uh, Europe, the, the largest budget for research and innovation ever adopted. Uh, in, in Europe uh, in order to make it possible to have these developments and support them. Right. So, well, that's that really sounds good and it's, it's futuristic. It kind of uh, tells us how the future collaboration on energy, the clean production is going to go. Uh, then lastly, Ambassador, how's been your experience with your visit in India this time and what expectations do you carry from the Indian government uh, on, uh, you know, the coordinated maritime presence? Mm. I feel there was um, a, a very positive, uh, welcoming uh, attitude um, when we talked to our uh, counterparts here in New Delhi. Uh, this was foreshadowed a bit already by the Indian ambassador whom I met uh, in Brussels beforehand. Um, I think uh, the Indian government is, is as I say, uh, openly uh, uh, welcomes the, the fact that Europe wants to be more engaged in this region, wants to contribute to regional uh, maritime security by the programs that we discussed. Yes. Um, and this is part of the upward trajectory in the bilateral relationship that we see at this point in time. Um, uh, maritime security is a key agenda item here and is one in Brussels and across Europe. So we see, uh, in my view, uh, an opportunity here um, that will not only be good for this specific issue, but, but good for the overall relationship. Yeah, indeed. I think the era of the EU-India cooperation uh, has just, uh, you know, begun and it's got, you know, it'll make great strides uh, in the future. So thank you so much. Once again, I thank you for this uh, very wonderful talk. Wish you good. Thank you very much, Swasti. It was a pleasure to have that conversation. Thank you so much.